Um, tonight, the witness of God. This is from 1 John chapter 5. There's a lot to say in regards to this little passage. I want to put three verses together tonight. We'll work 9 to 11, but really, really, really concentrating on this phrase from the ninth verse, the witness of God. I got a lot of stuff to get started with, and then tonight probably will be a little, if you were just looking at the screens tonight, not listening, like we just talked about doing, just screen, 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 you would really get lost pretty fast. We're going to take a left tonight out of this passage into another set of scriptures that I, I think to try to make a greater point uh, inside of this. Now, to do that, um, I want to just start with the text. Let's read the first three verses of our text, and then we have a few things to do to get us set up for where we want to go tonight, because this is not as far as I'm concerned, not a real easy subtitle, The Witness of God, simply because this is a circular argument. God witnesses of Jesus, because God witnesses of Jesus, I'm supposed to believe in Jesus. I don't see God, I can't see Jesus. Jesus causes me to believe in God. That circular argument of, I believe in God, thus I believe in Jesus, or I believe in Jesus, thus I believe in God. God proves to me that Jesus is real. Jesus proves to me that God is real. What, what happens if I can't land on one of those? Well, then the other one falls apart. And in some ways, I think it's what John's trying to do. He's really trying to link Jesus and the Father together so that there can't be one without the other because he has been raised in a Jewish culture where there is God. And he has met Jesus. And he believes he has found the circle. He has that, he's completed that circle that Jesus shows me what God looks like. God testifies of Jesus. But that circular argument falls apart if we don't know God. Can't, if we don't know God, then what is the use of him having a son? Who cares? I don't believe in God anyway. That can be your response. Or I'm supposed to believe in Jesus because God witnesses to him. I no more can see God than I can see Jesus. Therefore, if God's the one witnessing of Jesus, what good does that do me? Because I, God didn't walk up to me and tell me about Jesus. And so this isn't as easy as it appears. And yet John just casually lays this out there in 1 John 5. And so that causes me to really have to dig in today. And that's why we're going to take that hard left in just a moment, because we need to go out and find where God witnesses of this and what that might look like for us. And to do that, we're going to do a little New Testament Bible study. We will use a touch of old tonight. We, use, we usually use a lot of Old Testament here because the Old Testament is a lot of the underpinnings of these scriptures. But we're going to do some New Testament study. To start, let's read 1 John 5, 9, if we receive the witness of men. Here's our subtitle. The witness of God is greater, so watch the contrast. If you believe what a man says, John thinks you should. He's that man. We touched him, we handled him, we heard him. He is the word of life. If you received the witness of a man, say John, say anyone, then the witness of God is greater. That's a no-brainer. Of course the witness of God would be greater than the witness of man. God is greater. But again, that's not easy because what does that look like that God witnesses of Jesus? This is the witness of God which he has testified of his son. So God's witness is a testimony of Jesus, and yet we don't get that testimony for a couple verses. So you get this almost filler verse in verse 10. It's not really a filler. We'll, we'll deal with it at the end. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made God a liar because he's not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. Look at the end of verse 9. The witness of God, which he testified of his son. Look at the end of verse 10. The testimony that God gave of His Son, same thing. So John's really leading you up. God testifies of His Son. There's a testimony of the Son. What is that testimony? 11, this is the testimony. It's convenient. Colon, here it comes, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in His Son. So at the end of the day, John's really putting it back on what you have inside. Because remember, the real witness of God is the testimony He has of Jesus. And the testimony of Jesus is that you have the life of God where... In here, so you become sort of the litmus test of the witness of God. If you attest to the witness of God, it's going to come from in here. Where? Because when I point in here, we think the heart or inside, or maybe we even think up here in the mind, and that's where we run into a real issue. And that helps us get started tonight. Up until now in John, we've been identifying with the Holy Spirit. Greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. You've been given the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is an identity. And now John sort of expands those boundaries a little bit to say you have the witness of God inside of you and that God has testified. And this is an internal thing. And when we talk internal, we can talk soul, we can psyche, spirit, 
the pneuma, the seat of our emotions, all that stuff. And we're all within the parameters of, say, Hebrew and Greek. We're within the biblical understanding of what's inside of a man. But really, from the inside out comes the simplicity of the word faith, a word we tried to deal with a couple or three weeks ago. And every time I try to deal with faith, I do it real, real haltingly because faith to me seems like something you shouldn't have to talk about. It seems like something you should walk out, something you should experience. The more you try to define it, the slipperier it gets. You know, it's kind of like love. I mean, you can say you understand what love is, but until you show love, receive love, feel love, you don't know love. Faith kind of feels the same way. And we can talk the theology of faith, give a bunch of verses about faith, but faith is best practiced. It's something that you believe, whether you have the props to believe it or not, whether you have the, the physical stuff to believe it or not. In fact, faith really starts to come in, for lack of a better word, comes in handy when you don't have anything to look at and you don't have the props and you don't have the stuff you can touch and taste and feel and smell. And when it becomes new covenant over old covenant, when all the tangibleness disappears and you're left with the intangibles, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now faith is what you have left. Once you've dispensed of all of Moses, now faith is what we're left with. So what does that look like? Well, first of all, faith is never secondary to reason. We're all products of the Enlightenment, an era that for the last nearly 300 years has focused on reason, common sense, reasoning our way to answers, that which cannot be reasonably attained, doesn't need to be believed. And that sort of laid the foundation over the last few centuries of, of kind of removing and distancing ourselves from acknowledging God as real because we can quantify everything else, and therefore we can believe it, but because we can't quantify of God, then reasonable people wouldn't believe in God. Reasonable people would, would reason that if, he's, if you can't prove he's there, he's not there. Faith doesn't need to take a back seat to reason. Because a lot of times what we do is we start to define faith in terms of believing for what we can't prove after everything else has been disproved or proved. So I believe in her because I can see her. I believe in that chair because I can see it. I believe in this room because I'm in it. I believe in this podium because I can touch it. Um, can't do any of those things with God, but I have faith. Okay, I ran God through the ringer of everything else. See him, touch him, feel him, hear him, smell him. Okay, but I believe in him. And when we treat faith that way, faith becomes like the backup plan. Everything else becomes more important. What I can see, what I can touch, what I can smell, what I can taste, that stuff's real, but I still believe in God. So like my faith is still out there. And that attitude has caused us to focus more on the natural than the supernatural. We're working this thing backwards. Paul said to not set our affection on things on the earth, but on things above. And why are we the opposite of that? because we've made faith subservient to reason so that we use faith only where we can't find a reason for God or a reason to believe. I think we need to stop that. I think we need to elevate faith to the place where we believe because we have experienced his love. Okay. Christianity is not a head full of principles, patterns, ideas by which if we could implement them, we would change the world. I do think the world would be a better place if we lived by the principles of Jesus. How could it not? He's, what he, he's showing us what a man looks like on the earth. But we're not serving this through a, through a head knowledge. We're serving this through an experience of having met him. And I don't mean, and maybe you have, I don't discount anyone's personal testimony of how you came to this knowledge, but most of us haven't had a visual face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord Jesus. Um, we didn't reach out and shake his nail scarred hands. I'm not mocking visions and, and, and dreams. And I'm not saying people aren't experiencing God through a thousand different prisms. I don't tell God how he reveals himself to people. And I don't doubt people's experience. They say, I met Jesus sitting at the foot of my bed and that's how I was introduced to God. And I say, wow, that is a story. And I, I would like to hear more, but I don't build a theology out of it. Like the only way you can know Jesus is if he meets you at the foot of your bed. And that's what we tend to do when things get physical is we start to reason them into our theology that they are the only way to get saved. They're the only way to encounter God. It's the, we're, 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 
we're kind of that way with stuff anyway. Like it, the diet worked for me, therefore that's the diet everyone has to be on because if it worked for me, then it'll work for everyone. And we do that with our theology. Like that pattern, God moved. I was reading so many verses a day and I was always reading them. And somewhere in between cup two and cup three of coffee, if only, but only if I get up at a certain time and I'm wearing the right slippers, then I found that God will bless me on that couch. And then if I miss that, things don't go right. We create a theology of slippers and coffee and, and scriptures. And we do that when we start to elevate the tangible stuff, these reasonable things into the same realm of faith. Don't fall victim to placing faith and reason on the same level. Put faith higher. I don't mean let your brains fall out and believe any old thing that's presented in front of you because faith isn't about believing any old thing that comes in front of you. Faith is about believing the experience that you have with him and his love. And trust that experience above all other things. That's why we believe in Jesus. Not because we saw him at the foot of the bed, but because we've had our own unique, individualistic, and personal revelation. And what I mean by unique and individualistic is that I do not think salvation is a cookie cutter experience. And I think we have cheapened the relationship that man gets to have with the, with the most beautiful Creator. We've cheapened it by, by making everyone's experience look the same and sound the same and feel the same and come through the same lens. And we do that because we have denominational ideas about salvation or we have a certain theological set of rules about salvation. And then the pressure gets put on us to go win the lost at any cost and get out there and clutch souls out of the fire and then to get creative to do that. And, and what we found is that in, by creative, you can get people to make commitments if you preach a certain way or do a certain thing. And then commitments become the way in. And then saying a certain prayer becomes the magic way in. And signing a card and joining a church and getting baptized. And you know all this stuff. I'm going to have to go through a list of them until it's not about, until my faith is a set of regulations. Did you pray this prayer? Did you do this? Did you say that? Did you read that text? Did you quote that word? Did you say it out loud? And then if, if you meet that criterion, then we accept it. If you don't, well, I don't know if they're even saved. And I don't know about you, but I came up in a church culture that was always trying to determine which Christians were really Christians. I spent about as much time trying to figure out which Christians were really saved as I did winning the lost at any cost, you know, although that was a big motivator as well, whatever that cost might be. So it's not on me. Listen, it's not on me to prove Jesus is real to you. And it's not on you to prove Jesus is real to your dad, your neighbor, your best friend, your coworker. It's on him. The onus of responsibility is on God because he reveals himself to us through Jesus. It's his job, it's not my job. It's not the pastor's job to make you believe in a loving God. It is our job to unveil a loving God. We don't make people believe in anything. When you're in an environment where people are working hard to make you believe, you're probably in an environment where people haven't had a true revelation of what they're preaching or teaching. Because when you have to make people believe it, you're doing it so it will validate what you're saying as being true. If you've, you don't ever see the Apostle Paul trying to make people believe he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. Like, I saw him. You can believe it or don't believe it. I don't care. Here's what, here's what I know to be true. But when we're working hard, cr press, 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 right, get people to change their mind, we need to stop and check what's going on. So the responsibility is really his. We do not set the terms. And what I mean by that is we do not set the terms of revelation or salvation. We simply walk into it. We let the Father set the terms. He puts the playing field out in front of us. He's the one who meets us in our sin, meets us in our discouragement, meets us in our religion, meets us in our works, meets us in our ministry, meets us in our darkest hour. It's all on Him. The church facilitates. We're a part of it. But it's His terms. We walk into it and our faith meets the moment or it doesn't. Because in, in reality, that's what's going on with the gospel. Our faith either meets the moment when He reveals Himself to us or we don't meet the moment. We choose to reason our way out of why this isn't God or why it won't make good sense to my wallet or why it won't make my family happy or why it will make me an outsider. And so we've walked away from a lot of revelations because we weren't willing to pay the price of what it takes to walk into the fullness of that revelation. Guys, Jesus told his own disciples, 
Your enemies will be those of your own house, father against son, mother against daughter. Why do you say that? Well, because in a very Jewish sense, he was saying, if you accept me, you're going to have some of your family that's not going to receive me as Messiah. So there's going to be a split. But it's a universal principle to choose him, to walk into that faith. He's revealed himself to you and you go, I believe it. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost, and, and, and I hope it doesn't cost your family. I hope it doesn't cost your friends, but it might cost something that you don't expect. That's part of the price that you pay for having walked into that faith and met that moment and said yes instead of saying no. But what's the church do? We're really just called to participate. We're not called to save the world. I heard a preacher this week say, we're, our church is here to seek and save that which is lost. And I thought, you're 2,000 years too late. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. Your job, you don't seek and save anybody. You are a participant in the revelation of the kingdom to the world, but you are not revealing the kingdom to the world supernaturally. You're revealing it practically by the way you live and by the way you love. You don't force people into reasonableness. You don't force people into faith. You just live out Christ's life on the earth. You don't move people to revelation. That's God's role. That's God's job. Here's a for instance. When John received the revelation on the Isle of Patmos in the book of Revelation, the Bible says repeatedly he was in the Spirit. In Revelation chapter 1, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. In Revelation 4 and 5, when he goes up into the throne room, which we talked about last month, he's in the Spirit. You know why he's in the Spirit? Because you can't see those things if you're not in the Spirit. Now, I knew that. I understood that coming up in ministry. And so, and, and my Pentecostal charismatic background understood that. But how we got around that was we went, you better get in the Spirit. We go, well, how do you get in the Spirit? And then there was a big list of stuff you needed to purge to get in the Spirit and that you needed to do to get in the Spirit and that you could pray your way into the Spirit, fast your way into the Spirit, devote your way into the Spirit, purge your way into the Spirit. Whatever you need to do, get in the Spirit. Because when you get in the Spirit, then all kinds of great things will happen. And all we see in, in Revelation is John's on the Lord's day, boom, he's in the Spirit. It's on him to move on me. It's on me to receive his movement in my life. It's on me to display faith in what he moves. And so put it on him. Trust that God's big enough to transform the lives of the people around you that you love. Yeah. That it's not your role to do it, that it's his role to reveal himself to them. But then don't stand in the way and make it difficult for them to see God because you make him cold and hateful and unloving and unjust and demanding. And, and every time they turn around, he's, he's on their case and they go, man, I don't want to hear about God. Why would they want to hear about God? That's hell. That's misery. Every time they're around you, you make them feel worse about themselves. They're depressed. They're mad. They're angry. And then you're calling it the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't you like to sign up for that so you could feel this 24-7? Why would I? Let Christ be the transformer. How do we, what do we do? Love them. Show them the life of God on the earth. That's us as agents of the kingdom. We're not the givers of revelation, but we're walking in a revelation we have. We don't have to prove that revelation. We don't have to reasonable uh, uh, put all of it into, into reason and be in a constant mode of apologetics and defending the text and defending the historical Jesus. Don't let faith drop to the level of natural intellect that props things up with what it can prove. Instead, realize that the experience is what Christ is doing in each and every one of us. That leads me to the great experiential book of the New Testament. All right? Here's that hard left. Because if we're going to talk witness of God, we got to go to where God witnesses. Now, what we could do is go to the Gospels and watch God talk about Jesus. You could watch Jesus get dunked into the Jordan. He comes out, the dove comes down, rests on his shoulder. This is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. We go, that's God witnessing of his son. Yes, it is. We could do the same thing at transfiguration. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the top of the mountain. Here comes Moses. Here comes Elijah. Let's build three tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Boom. The light shines from heaven and everybody falls down prostrate before God. And when they open their eyes, they hear but one voice. This is my son. Hear him. Everybody else disappears because the testimony of God is Moses won't work. Elijah won't work. Jesus alone works. All of those things are great. Those are witnesses of God. Without a doubt, those are witnesses of God. But when you talk to the church about what God's salvation program looks like, the church runs to the book of Acts because we feel as if the book of Acts is the template 
for the modern day church. We feel as if if they did it in Acts, we should be doing it today. But we feel as if if it falls within those 28 chapters of Acts, then that's an example of what the Holy Spirit will do if he moves inside of a church and he really has his way, you know, that sort of thing. And Acts presents the many ways in which God gives witness, often used as a book that shows, quote unquote, how things are to be. And I'm doing this so sort of tongue in cheek because I don't believe that your landing spot's gonna be, you get to the end of the book of Acts, go, that's how everything ought to be. Um, you're going to find that's impossible, by the way. And, and I'll tell you, show you why. And yet, Acts contains no uniform code of salvation. I want to stop there. There's a period. So I'm, going to, I'm just going to say this. Some people would absolutely call me a heretic for that sentence right there. And I'm going to tell you why. Because they truly believe that there is a uniform code of salvation and that it falls somewhere at the end of the second chapter of the book of Acts. Right. That when Peter says that you repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They believe that, that that is God's edict for exactly how people are to be saved. And they would have a great point if the book of Acts was silent for the next 26 chapters. The problem is it's not. People keep getting saved and none of them fall into the Acts 238 category. So either everybody after Peter is wrong and boy, there's some people that would like that kind of gospel in the world. There's one way, only way, everybody else is wrong, they're all going to burn in hell. Go, well, that's easy. Just get in the right way, everybody else is lost. Let's go, okay, I'm there. I've been, I've been in that camp of found it, everybody else is wrong, get on board, don't get on board, I don't care. Me and Jesus got our own thing going, we'll go to heaven, you guys can all go to hell. Boy, that's a loving gospel, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's full of the love of God. <laughs> I was just about to say, aren't you glad you don't come to that every week? And I thought, no one would come to that. You wouldn't be coming to this every week. You would have, like, after the first week, went, well, I've had enough of that. I'm not going to go sit underneath the hate of God. I'd really go find the love of God. So there's no uniform code. There's no absolute uniform code of salvation. And in spite of that, the book of Acts is loaded with revelation. The book of Acts is loaded with salvation. And yes, the book of Acts is loaded, loaded with rejection which very rarely gets talked about, but an enormous amount of people reject the gospel of Jesus Christ in the book of Acts, regardless of who's presenting it. Peter, Philip, Stephen, Paul, Silas, Barnabas, all kinds of cast of characters is enormous. Even Jesus gets in on the game of presenting the gospel in the book of Acts. And yet, there's great revelation. People see things they've never seen before. There's great salvations. There's great rejection. So, a great template is to take a look at the book of Acts and say, what's God's witness? What can we see God doing? And how will that let us know the witness of Christ? What I'm trying to do here is elevate your faith, okay? I'm gonna elevate your faith over, just even over your reason, so that your faith says, I don't have to, I don't have to find God landing in the same spot for her and for him and for him. What I have to do is find the heartbeat of God and I think you'll find the heartbeat of God in Jesus. And then watch how, this is why I'm going to do this in the book of Acts. Watch how as Acts unfolds, the heartbeat of God, Jesus, looks different to different audiences. Different modes. Which ought to tell us that God isn't working from a uniform place. He's working from a place of love called the cross. And out of that, he's doing his work. Okay? Here's some examples. Now, we got to really be careful because i got a bunch of these. And... Hmm. So, this is a hard left into Acts. So, if I, at times we start getting faster, it's because I know we got more coming, and so some things just get dropped. So, we'll just start out slow, enjoy ourselves, because these first few, I really think, great, great understanding of the witness of God. Acts 1. <laughs> we won't do this on every chapter, by the way. So, you're going to think, oh gosh, I can't do this. We don't do this on every chapter. Acts 1. Jesus is taken into a cloud ascends. Okay. Luke uses imagery from Daniel, where the Ancient of Days is enthroned on a cloud so that his reader will find Jesus in Daniel and see him ascending to heaven in Acts 1. So he will make a connection that the Ancient of Days rides on the cloud, the Ancient of Days to whom a kingdom is given in the book of Daniel. 
And if the Ancient of Days is riding on a cloud in the book of Daniel to whom the kingdom is given, and then here goes Jesus disappearing into heaven on a cloud, Luke's trying to make a connection so that his reader will go, oh, maybe this is the same one from Daniel who's been handed the kingdoms of the earth or the kingdom of God, rather, and thrown on a cloud, this image of Jesus enthroned kicks off the book of Acts. It's out of the gate. People act like Acts starts at Pentecost. Wrong. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not how God kicks off the Acts of the Apostles. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit cannot occur as we know it until there's an enthronement of the Lamb who is slain, who sits down at the right hand of his Father. Only then is man into receiving mode of receiving the Holy Spirit. So don't skip Acts 1 on your way to Acts 2. Acts 1, Jesus goes up on a cloud, connecting him to the image from Daniel, showing Jesus reigns as a king. That was the whole point of putting him on a cloud so that the audience would know the king is in front of heaven. The king is on his throne in heaven. Now, if the king is on his throne, what does, he, what does that mean he has? Kings rule over kingdoms. And so what that was to do was before you ever turn the page on Acts 2, the disciples believed, okay, there's a kingdom. How do I know this? Because the last thing they asked him before he ascends is, is this the time when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus goes, don't worry about that stuff. Times and seasons aren't for you. What you need to know is that you're going to receive power and that you're going to be martyrs for me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth geographically outward because that's what the Holy Spirit does. Boom. And rolls out across time. And then gets on a cloud and ascends into heaven as a direct answer to their question. When do we get the kingdom? Watch. I'll show you what the kingdom looks like. Boom. On a cloud up into the heavens. That's the kingdom they were waiting for. Therefore, Acts takes off from there. We've got ourselves a king. He's in a kingdom. He's sitting on the throne. The great modern tragedy is that we have made Jesus our personal savior rather than as a king reigning over a kingdom. Because what happens as we watch the disciples leave Acts chapter 1 and move into the rest of the book is they begin to go preach the gospel of the kingdom. When you get to Acts 28, the end of the book, Paul's in a house in Rome preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What's he preaching? The king is in his kingdom. Stop paying attention to the kingdoms of the earth. Don't set your heart on things here. Set your heart on things above. That doesn't mean just look up waiting to go to heaven. Fixate on the king. Because if you don't fixate on the king, you'll fixate on a king. You'll get impressed with Caesars and presidents. But if you'll find the king... All that other stuff will be at least secondary and probably much farther down the line. But what did we do to the gospel? We turned it into a formula. We stamped it. We, we did the whole American way, man. Figure it out. Franchise it. Stamp it. Send it out 10,000 times around the world. Make stuff bigger, better, broader. How do you do that? you got to make stuff cleaner and faster. We can't wait around on people to get a revelation of Jesus and slow walk into faith. we got to have something where we can count. Right now, count. How many of you? Right now. Anybody, 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 anybody? Like an auctioneer. Then everybody says the prayer, comes home, boom, we're ready to go. Absolutely got it all cut and dry. This is how many people came to Jesus. This is how much bigger we're getting. This is how good we're doing. And we don't say for the kingdom because that's language we don't really understand. When we use it, we usually think it just means bigger buildings. And the kingdom has nothing to do with containment. In fact, it's the opposite of containment. It knocks fences and walls down. It doesn't rebuild them. It doesn't say, oh, we've got to control the environment. You know, that's what the kingdom's all about. No, it knocks it all down. And if people wander and they scatter, and don't worry, they will, you got a good shepherd who knows how to go find people. That's his job. And so he goes and loves people. But what happens very quickly is we make Jesus the personal Lord of our lives. Now, I'm not cutting down personal Lord Jesus. My goodness, have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's not, the game. That's not the name of salvation. The king's on his throne. Everything you see is an illusion. The real king is on his throne. He shows you how to love your enemies. He shows you how to navigate a world that's against you. He shows you you don't have to step on necks to get ahead. He shows you that sometimes the greatest thing that you can do in order to inherit the earth is to truly be meek, to know when to sheath your sword, to know when not to strike back, 
not to study the, the art of war according to the business world and according to the military world and according to the governmental world and figure out how you ought to do it and slap some Jesus on it. Put your Jesus stamp, roll your Jesus stamp on it and call Christianized version of business, Christianized version of government, Christianized version of winning, Christianized version of revenge and retaliation. And before long, you're propping up so many versions of Jesus, it becomes difficult to find the one that died at Calvary. And so as you progress through this book, watch these revelations not be uniform. This is the beauty of Acts. They're not uniform because the Holy Spirit's coming in going, don't tell me how I save people. Don't tell me how I reach people. I reach people. And I'll do it any way I have to do it. So here's an example. Acts 2. <laughs> 3,000 Jews are converted by a sermon that never once mentions the blood of Jesus and it never shows the cross as a means of sacrifice. Those are two primary sources of the gospel right now. You've got to preach the blood to wash away sins and you've got to preach the cross as a sacrifice. Peter doesn't even know that. It never crosses his mind that Jesus died on the cross as a sacrifice for sins. Not in Acts 2. Instead, he quotes a couple obscure passages from Psalms. He takes one from the book of Joel, preaching the end of the world, and he uses guilt as the primary force. The heartbeat of his sermon is, you guys killed him. Don't you feel bad about it? And 3,000 of them do. Fear works. People will convert. I'm not crazy about it. It's not the way I want to present it. There's no Gentile. By the way, this is a very sectarian gospel right here. There's no Gentiles allowed. There's no, we don't have any evidence there's women getting saved. This is a very closed version of the gospel. But we're up and running, baby. We're out of the gates with, at Pentecost. We're out of the gates and we're moving with the gospel. And by the way, out of this comes the verse that Peter says, Repent, be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ. You see remission of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that has become like the method of salvation for some. Out of that style sermon. So if you're going to quote Peter there, don't ever preach the cross as a sacrifice and don't ever mention the blood because Peter didn't do either one of them. Tells me the Holy Spirit can work around, work over, work under, work through. He's on a mission. The witness of God has nothing to do with nailing theology. The witness of God doesn't have to do with getting all the things squared up the way they're supposed to be. It's a revelation of God that captures the heart of man. And these convert. I don't know how long they last. The book of Acts is a progressive book as, as well. So watch how some of this stuff just begins to sort of bend and grow. I gave you a verse from this. It's 247. This is how this chapter ends. They were praising God and they had favor with all the people. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The word church isn't in the Greek. The Lord added daily those who were being saved, those who were being, 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 not just got. Those who were being saved. This is one of your first indicators that the Holy Spirit is in the progressive salvation business, that He is saving, so that He is converting, He is shifting our minds, changing our hearts. They most definitely were in the process of being saved. Did you hear their theology in Acts 2? <laughs> I mean, their theology is, you guys killed Jesus. Don't you feel bad about it? Okay, they're in the process of being saved because there's probably going to need to be some work done. Hey, I got news for you. If you came in, if this was the gospel that you heard when you first came to church, hey, you're going to burn in hell if you don't accept Jesus as your Savior tonight. You might have walked up there and raised your hand and said the prayer, but you're in the process of being saved because someone put some baggage on you when they introduced you to Jesus, and we're going to have to see you saved from the baggage. Yeah. Because if not, you're going to walk through your Christian walk probably scared half the death of God. And why? In the world? It's going to become difficult to be a disciple of someone you're freaked out over. And so there's going to be baggage. Now listen, I come to Jesus probably like a lot of you did. I met Jesus, but I was handed some bags. Like, welcome, follow me. Can you carry this? And then it was like, oh gosh. Now a lot of people just go a little ways and they just go, forget this. They throw the bags down and they run as far as they can from the Lord. And it doesn't make me or you better or worse because maybe we did or didn't do that. Somewhere along the way, I had to be saved again. I don't mean that I gave up on the Lord. I had to be saved from some of the bags. I was handed so much junk. And then when I went into ministry, I picked up a bunch more. 
Like this is the thing you have to do now. And it took years to lay that stuff down, to just go, I can't do this. I, don't, I can't continue to live this if, the, if I got to carry that load. And that's when I tell you that his yoke is easy, his burden is light. Because it's not that you stop working, it's that you start working efficiently when you yoke up with Jesus and you go, God, a bunch of the stuff I've been carrying, you want to carry. Why am I carrying what you died to carry? And so we let him carry it. Acts 5, this is just to prove to you that we're not doing every single chapter this way. So you skip 3 and 4, because we could have stayed in there, but we didn't. Acts 5, believers were added. In Acts 5, believers were added because they saw miracles. But not everyone, because what worked on one didn't work on everyone. Let me give you an example. Acts 5, 12, through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Look at that. What if we could see miracles and everybody agreed? That'd do it, wouldn't it? If we could see miracles and we had unified doctrine, everybody was in one accord, then we'd change the world, right? Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. 14. Believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes, both men and women. Look at Acts 5. Oh, stretching its legs. Only men get it in Acts 2 by Acts 5. It goes, okay, ladies, come on in. Because the gospel is going to beat up on your cultural theology if you give it time. It's going to stretch its legs on out. So women, welcome in. So that they brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Believers were increasingly added. But according to the previous verse, not everybody believed. How in the world? Church unified in theology. Church seeing signs, wonder, miracles. Not everybody believed because it's not universal of what it takes to reach every person. You go, if they could come in one of those Holy Ghost services, they'd give their hearts to Jesus. Or they would run as fast as they could out of that service and go, I'm, they're losing their minds in there. I don't want anything to do with this. And I don't mean that you should stop doing what you're doing in that service. Just don't expect that your experience yeah. is her experience, yeah. is his experience. Acts doesn't support you in this, is my point. Acts doesn't support you in the idea that, boy, if we could be like the church of Acts, everybody would have it the same way. No, they wouldn't. They didn't have it the same way in Acts. They didn't have it the same way in one chapter of Acts. Wait another chapter and watch how they don't have it the same way they had it one chapter ago. Because that's the progressive nature of the Holy Spirit. We'll jump farther. Look at Acts 8. In Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer believes on Jesus and is baptized. But then Simon tries to buy the power to heal using money. He literally pulls out his wallet and asks Peter, hey, how much would it take for you to teach me how to do this? It doesn't go over very well. What happens is it is revealed that he is not a true believer. The first admission in the book of Acts that maybe there is more to salvation than a singular formula because Simon the sorcerer played the formula game. Believe, get baptized. Believe, get baptized. Believe, get baptized. That's what it means to be saved. Then Acts 8, there's a crack in the fissure. And the crack is, mm, oh gosh, I don't know. I don't think this guy really got it. Yeah, but he did the formula. Okay, maybe it's not formulaic. Maybe it's not just believe on Jesus, get dunked in water, boom, you're going home. Maybe... Acts 8 is where things begin to ratchet up, where you begin to go, hmm, salvation is more than repeating a prayer. Salvation is more than getting dunked in a river. Salvation goes into the heart of who a man is. If the heart isn't changing, is he being saved? Because remember, it's about being saved. If something isn't transforming, Acts 8 doesn't land on a real great theological spot. We don't know what to do with Simon the Sorcerer to this day in scholarship. We don't really know what to do, which I think is the point of the book of Acts is to go, you don't get to figure everything out. No, you don't get to land on the spot you think you should land on. Just know that it's not a formula. There's not a bunch of magic prayers and magic words, but there's something happening down in the heart. Also in Acts 8, there's an Ethiopian eunuch. We don't even have time to get into how shocking it is that an Ethiopian eunuch, a castrated male who is sitting in a chariot sent by the queen of Ethiopia into Jerusalem to celebrate. We don't know why. Is he Jewish? He's a Gentile, or at least he's from a Gentile nation, but he comes into Jerusalem to celebrate. And what in the world is he doing with a copy of the scroll of Isaiah? You don't just buy one of those in the bookstore. It's not as if there's a published Bible on the local corner, but he's carrying the scroll of Isaiah and he's reading Isaiah 53. 
and he has no idea what he's reading, and lo and behold, one of Jesus' disciples walks by. This is a weird little moment in the book of Acts. And Philip's just strolling down the, the street, and the guy's in the chariot reading, and Philip goes, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy goes, how can I understand what I'm reading? Acts chapter 8, verse 32, the, uh, the, the place in the scripture that he was reading was this. This is Isaiah 53. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before its shearer is silent. He opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. Who will declare his generation? His life is taken from the earth. Before you go any further, this is our first moment. This is our first chronological moment in Scripture where somebody reaches back into Isaiah and finds Jesus. And it's Philip with an Ethiopian eunuch sitting in a chariot reading Isaiah, not knowing what in the world he's reading. How can I know what I'm reading? What's this mean? And Philip, winging it, man, just listening to the Holy Spirit. It's not like there's a commentary out there on how to handle this or that he had time to go to Bible college. Yeah, he don't smartphone it and Google it, but instead he listens to the Spirit and watches his response. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, who is the prophet talking about, himself or some other man? And Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. And the eunuch says, what would stop me from believing? And Philip goes, nothing. You want to believe on Jesus? Come on out of that chariot. And he baptizes him. And we don't ever get to hear from the eunuch again. We don't know what happened. And once again, it's like Acts just sort of tips its cap and moves right on to the next chapter. And it goes, I'm not going to tell you all the answers, but I'm showing you that I don't need your rules in order to save people. I can even reach people when they read scripture and they don't have any other means of support. And I can still do it even in that moment. Acts chapter 9, probably the most famous conversion in the New Testament. Saul converted on the road to Damascus. No preacher, no sermon, no scripture, no revival, no camp meeting, no evangelist. None of Jesus' disciples are involved in any way. Saul could have made the whole thing up. He hinges his life on this moment. He literally puts his life on the line for an experience only he can prove he had. Even the guys with him are blinded and can't see what's going on. He doesn't even have one eyewitness to his own salvation. It's amazing to me that God lets us, the modern church, receive the new covenant through that eyewitness. It's like you're going to have to take this thing on faith, man. You are going to have to accept the witness of God. And Saul's conversion is so amazing because when he first sees Jesus, he says, who are you? And the response is, I'm the Lord Jesus whom you persecute. Acts 9, 17 and 18, he goes into Ananias' house. Saul does now that he's met Jesus. Ananias goes his way and enters the house and laying his hands on him, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit, 18. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. He received his sight at once. He arose and he was baptized. Look at that. Experience precedes baptism. Experience precedes receiving the Holy Spirit. Up until this point, the book of Acts didn't think that was possible. Can you see what's happening? God is witnessing of Jesus his way. Not your way. Not your way. Not your way. Not their way. His way. I can do it any way I want to. I can reach you even if, you're, even if your sermon just makes people feel guilty. I can get in there even if it's a eunuch doesn't know what in the world he's reading. I'll send somebody his way. I'll reach him if he's persecuting my church. And I got to do it all by myself because I don't have anybody that loves him enough to go preach to him. I'll, I'll go find him. I will win this war. I will win this battle. Acts 10. I'm hurrying. Acts 10. House of Cornelius. Italians. Gentiles. The first named Gentile recipient of the gospel. We're finally there in the book of Acts chapter 10. We're halfway through the book of Acts before we figure it's time to go let some Gentiles in. Remember, it took five chapters to let women in. It takes five more chapters to let Gentiles in. The gospel's expanding, expanding, expanding. By the way, that was never God's fault. We're always the one that holds him back. <laughs> we think we can do a good job of pushing it out. All we really do a good job is holding God back. Just holding God back, you're only allowed in this person, you're only allowed to touch that person, you're only allowed to save that person, you're only allowed to bless that person, you're only allowed to call that person, you're only allowed to anoint that person, and then that starts to shift and drift, and, and then if you shift and drift too fast, the rest of the church will go, you're compromising. We've always done it this way. And my answer to some of that is, you've always done it this way because you've always been holding God back. 
some of this you gotta just let your hands off of. Let God do what he wants to do. Acts 10, House of Cornelius received the Spirit and then they were baptized. Formulas were being totally upturned. Peter didn't think that was possible. First of all, he didn't think it was possible that Gentiles could receive the Holy Spirit. And then when they did, he went, here's water. What would forbid him from getting baptized? It's almost as if Peter goes, remember back in Acts 2 when I told you the only way to get saved was to get baptized? I'm not so sure about that. Because all these Italians have the same Holy Spirit I have. And none of them got baptized. He goes, well, maybe we should probably go ahead and baptize them anyway. I, I don't know if you catch this. But this is remarkable. I mean, this is the guy that Jesus looked at and said, you're the rock on this rock. I'm going to build my church. Now get out there and do it. And Peter's doing the best he can. And at every turn, he's short. He, he always undercut. He never, he, never, he never releases God to the level that it should. And he's always shocked. It's not formulaic. God is upturning his theology. They don't even have to be baptized. He gave him the Holy Spirit. I mean, I'm going to go ahead and baptize him, but look at this. He didn't even wait around on my theology. God did whatever he wanted without everybody raising their hand saying the sinner's prayer. Wait a minute. It's not supposed to work this way. You're not supposed to be able to do this. Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas are in jail at Philippi. And this happens. Acts 16, 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were open. Everyone's chains were loosed. 27, and the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors were open, supposing the prisoners had fled, draws his sword and is about to kill himself. The guy just figures, I'm going to go ahead and commit suicide because my career is over. If I let these guys out on my watch, it's over with anyway. I'm better off dead. But Paul called with a loud voice and said, do yourself no harm. We're all here. Then he called for a light. He ran in. He fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They didn't even preach the gospel. They didn't quote one verse. They didn't preach the gospel. They just loved the dude at the point of suicide. They just loved the dude at the point of suicide. And his question, hey, what do I need to do to get saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be saved. You, oh, watch this. Hey, man, don't hold God back. Who knows? Maybe he'll save the whole house. I mean, we've been shorting God for this whole book. Maybe we all just knock the walls down, see what happens if we just give it a shot. You could be saved, you and your whole house. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and they went ahead and spoke the word to all of them were in his house. They're figuring, hey, I mean, you know, why not? God's saving whoever he wants to. I mean... Women are getting saved, Italians are getting saved, Gentiles are getting saved, eunuchs are getting saved. I mean, why in the world not see what happens if you just give everybody a shot? Everybody in the house. Anybody in the house want to get saved? He took them the same hour of the night. He washed their stripes. Look at that. He's not even saved yet, and he's more charitable than most of us know how to be. He takes them into his house, and he gives them cleanup. He gives them medicine. He literally helps fix their physical bodies, and immediately he and all of his family were baptized. That's a jump, isn't it? I mean, look at that. He just starts to love Paul and Silas. And immediately, what does Paul do? No prayer, no commitment, no confession, no beg God to forgive him. Just immediately went, hey man, welcome to the family. We would have made sure he went to six weeks of Bible study training before we qualified him to be a part of the ministry team. And Paul went, I think maybe you and your whole house are qualified because you have a charity that I haven't seen. Now, when he brought them into his house, he set food before them. He rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. There's an indication here that really influences Paul. When, he, when Paul gets to the book of 1 Corinthians, he says, if you're saved and your spouse is not saved, he goes, if you can stand it, stay with them because you sanctify them by staying with them. One of the most powerful passages in Christianity that never gets preached. That's right. Because we're so personal salvation oriented that we ignore that Paul said, listen, if they're around you, they're in good shape being around you. you just being in your house makes a difference. Where did he get that? I kind of think he got it right here. I kind of think he watched God move on one guy and then he went, this whole house is good. 
This whole house is good. This guy's got it. God's going to, I'm not even going to try to get you to swallow that. All right. I'm just going to lay that out there and let you do what you want with it. You got to take personal revelation or reject it. It's your call. Acts 19. This is the last one. I promise. Acts 19 verse one. It happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, I love this one. Paul having passed through the upper regions came to Ephesus and he found some disciples and he said to them, did you guys receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, we haven't so much as heard whether there be a Holy Spirit. Now, why in the world does Paul ask this question? This is the thing that always amazes me. I really think it's not as if Paul walks into every town and asks this. We don't ever see him ask this question. He don't walk into town and go, hey, you guys all get filled with the Holy Ghost? That's how we used to preach this in Pentecost. Is that you get up in front of people and go, hey, how, you all ought to get filled with the Holy Ghost? If you haven't been filled with the Holy Ghost, listen up. No. There's something about these guys' lives that doesn't match up to the Jesus they claim they're following. That's the only way I can figure it. Because when Paul gets introduced to them, he goes, hey, you guys receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? It's almost like me saying, do you realize what you signed up for? And their answer is, oh, we don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> that's honesty right yeah. I, mean, I don't even know what you're talking about okay now how does paul handle that and he said into what then were you baptized tell me how tell me about your conversion experience tell me about your revelation it's all about how he revealed himself to you that's the key how'd that happen for you and they go well we got saved into john's baptism and that's a code for those that haven't followed the gospels that's John the Baptist preceding Jesus, the way maker for Christ, but not quite Christ. John the Baptist baptizing you into natural repentance, but not baptizing you into a resurrected Savior because John the Baptist can't baptize you into a resurrected Savior because John's ba baptism is preceding the cross. This is an ancient form. This is a non-revelatory salvation. This is a theology salvation, not a heart salvation. And Paul goes... John did baptize with a baptism that would get you to change your mind. It's repentance. Saying to the people that they should believe on the one that would come after. That is, Paul loves to throw in the word Christ because that's the anointed one. He's slapping that on a resurrected man. It's not just Jesus. On Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. What happens? Is Paul sees people who have had a theology of salvation but no heart change. This might be the way Paul would deal with Simon the sorcerer. I don't know. But whatever it is, he goes, let me introduce you to the Christ. What have we done? We've introduced revelation. How? The witness of God on this person and this person and this person and this person and this person. And this one doesn't look like this one. Doesn't look like this one. Doesn't look like that one. She doesn't look like him. Doesn't look like him. Doesn't look like her. But it's Jesus. Why do we land in this soft spot, this sweet zone every week where everybody feels that presence before you walk out of this room? Because where we land every week is Jesus, mm -hmm. not Democrat, Republican, yeah. black, white, men, women, rich, poor, Baptist, Pentecost, American, non-American, Jesus. It's where we find our centerpiece, our unity. It's where we get at peace with each other. Whatever we bring in. In Jesus, we go, mm, we are all one. Neither Jew nor Gentile, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ. And if we are in Christ, we're Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. We have received what he has given. 1 John 5, 9 through 11. Back where we started, right? I'm not going to read it all. Let's start in 10. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who doesn't believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed his testimony that God has given of his Son. This is that testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Let's look at that. Eternal life does not refer to life after death because how in the world would that be a witness to the living? I mean, if eternal life is the testimony, then eternal life must mean more than where you go when you die because how would that prove anything to me? I don't know where you go when you die. You're dead. I mean, I have a theology about it, but I can't, that doesn't prove to me Jesus is real because you died. How does your eternal life prove anything to me? So it can't be on the other side of the grave. Eternal life is the life of God lived out in Jesus. Do we have a text? Yes, we do. John 17, 3. This is eternal life. 
that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. What would that have looked like in Jewish terms? Jeremiah 9, 23, 24. Thus says the Lord, don't let a wise man glory in his wisdom. Don't let a mighty man glory in his might. Don't let a rich man glory in his riches. It's all poetic. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and he knows me. I'm the covenant God, exercising loving kindness, justice, and righteousness in the earth. In these I delight. He said, don't, don't glory in your might, your wisdom, or your riches. Glory in knowing these things about me. I love people. I declare justice and I declare righteousness. That's eternal life. That is what God told the people through Jeremiah to brag about. If you got that, boast it up. End here, start here next week. 512. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Good place to kick off next week. This, is a, this has been a fun one. Tough to close. It's like there's just all of this great stuff you want to just keep saying about Jesus and the beauty of who he is. And so rather than me clouding it with my adjectives of him, let you have your own revelation of who he is. Father, your work is to reveal in a way that I can't put into words and I'd only mess it up. I don't know how to get people to believe. I don't even think it's my job. It is my privilege to participate in the unveiling of a lovely Jesus to the world. Father, if we've done that tonight, I pray your blessings on it. And where we messed it up, where our theology was crude or rude or misinformed, just go slicing through that like you did in the book of Acts. Find us anyway. I pray that the place we land is in this beautiful place of seeing the witness of God exactly how you have each one of us to see it. And I pray that for the, for the many, many people who will watch and listen to this now and for years to come. Give them that witness however they need to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen.